and good day. And I am Megan Matheson. I'm a co-lead of the Canadian Marine Shipping Risk Forum, along with uh, Dr. Ron Pillow, who's also here today. And I'm the Director of Strategy and Innovation for the Clear Seas Centre for Responsible Marine Shipping as well. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm joining from the traditional ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and sligo tooth nations who stewarded the lands and waters since time immemorial. Uh, I'd like to do a few brief introductions before we get into uh, our sessions for today. So first, the Canadian Marine Shipping Risk Forum is a community of practice that's hosted by MEOPAR, the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network, and Clear Sea Centre for Responsible Marine Shipping. The community of practice is uh, open to all who are interested in the work of understanding and mitigating shipping risk. And we, we encourage you to share, share it with uh, colleagues and friends if they, they don't know about it yet. Um, there's a sign up to the mailing list on the Clear Seas website, and we send out periodic emails to announce events of, of interest and um, send out those invitations. So thanks so much for joining us today. We're focusing on um, AIS, and this is our third session talking about the various applications of AIS. And today we're focused on benefiting communities and we've got speakers from Canada and also New Zealand today. So I'd like to ask that all participants remain muted during the presentation. Uh, you're welcome to keep your video on or off however is comfortable for you. And uh, once our session, once the presentation is finished we'll have time for questions. So you're encouraged to either raise your hand and unmute yourself to ask your question directly, or if you'd prefer to type it into the chat, I'll monitor the chat and read out any questions uh, to our speakers to respond to. And um, I don't think we've got enough time today to be able to, to do a round of introductions of everybody, but it is nice to know who's in the room. So if you wanted to put your name, your organization, and a little bit about what you do into the chat, uh, then you, know, you could uh, send that to everyone in the meeting and people can get a sense of, of who's here today. But I think we have a good mix of government, industry, academics, uh, communities, and, and others who are interested in marine shipping risks. So it's great to, to see you all here. So first off, um, our agenda for today, we're starting with uh, Kelly Larkin and Olivia Hall are going to be talking about the Enhanced Marine Situational Awareness Program that they've been working on through Transport Canada for the last few years as part of the Oceans Protection Plan. Uh, then we'll have some questions for them, a break, and then we'll move into our second presentation for this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And that is um, from Moritz Lemon, who is with Starboard Maritime out of New Zealand, and he will be focusing his presentation on uh, applying AIS data for operational biosecurity risk assessment from hitchhiker pests to biofouling. And then we'll have more time for questions and then we'll wrap up um, and you'll be on your way for the rest of your day. So I will start off by introducing uh, Kelly Larkin. He is the program manager with Transport Canada and he's had a um, interesting career of different uh, senior leadership appointments within the public and private sectors and responsibility for complex and geographically dispersed operations in the Royal Canadian Navy, federal and provincial governments, and also um, the BC marine industry. As a former captain on three of Her Majesty's Canadian ships of the Royal Canadian Navy and an executive officer in submarines, uh, Kelly's got expertise in a wide range of national and international maritime security operations, including piracy suppression in the Arabian Sea before, uh, before joining Transport Canada. His community roles include serving as a member of the board of directors for the Royal Canadian Sea Cadet Education Fund. And now with Transport Canada, he is working in partnership with Indigenous nations across Canada's three coasts to advance the Enhanced Marine Situational Awareness Initiative uh, under the Oceans Protection Plan. Kelly has an MBA from Royal Roads and a Master of Defence Studies from the Royal Military College of Canada. And I'll also introduce Olivia Hall as they're doing a joint presentation. So Olivia is the Program Advisor for the Ocean Protection Plan with Transport Canada. And she's been working with Transport Canada for the past couple of years. Uh, working to protect Canada's coast, restore marine ecosystems, create a stronger Indigenous partnerships, and engage coastal communities through the EMSA program. Prior to joining Transport Canada, Olivia worked with Public Services and Procurement Canada, and she previously completed, completed a Bachelor of Arts in Geography and Environmental Studies at University of Victoria. 
So Kelly and Olivia will be providing an overview of the EMSA platform and a brief demonstration of how it works. So I will hand over to Kelly. Great, thanks very much. Oops, am I uh, unmuted? Yes, I am. Good morning and uh, thanks very much for the, uh, the kind introduction, Megan. Um, yes, good morning, everyone. Now, once again, I'm Kelly Larkin, the Transport Canada Regional Program Manager for EMSA, which stands for Enhanced Maritime Situational Awareness. Um, and I'm joined, as uh, Megan mentioned, by uh, uh, one of our team members, Olivia Hall, who's part of our Pacific EMSA team. And Olivia is responsible for working with our partners on the BC South Coast. Uh, there's a, a total of four of us here in Pacific region and, uh, um, and another six that uh, work from, from headquarters in Ottawa. So we have a, a really uh, quite a, a diverse range of skills and expertise in our EMSA team to, uh, uh, for working with our partners as we deliver on the EMSA project. So today we're going to provide you with some background information on the EMSA project with a particular emphasis on our partnership with Indigenous communities from across Canada's three coasts. I'll also speak specifically about how AIS is used on the EMSA platform. Uh, and, and then uh, Olivia will provide a, a demo of some of EMSA's key capabilities, including AIS data applications. Um, and I, I appreciate that um, you may have questions as we go, so please do raise questions in chat and then we'll have a, a, a Q&A session at the end. So before we get into the specifics, I'd like to provide you with a little bit of background on the EMSA project. The story of EMSA goes back to late 2014, even before the Oceans Protection Plan began. Transport Canada and other federal partners have begun a series of workshops along the coast to explain how the marine safety system works and to get feedback from Indigenous and other coastal communities on how we could do things better and more collaboratively. One key observation was the importance of in Indigenous involvement in the marine safety system. And that's so that they could be part of the planning and decision-making associated with marine occurrences and other emergencies. And this is a, a fairly obvious need, uh, given that it, when you look at the slide that I've got up right there, um, that each one of these incidents pictured here, upper left was the Leviathan II, uh, a whale watching vessel that capsized uh, with the loss of... Uh, Sorry to interrupt, Kelly. Um, I've just updated the settings so that you're now co-host. Can you try sharing your screen again? Um, Sure. You, you don't yeah. have it right now. I don't see it right now. Um, and okay. I, I may not be. The, I may be the only one, but I may not be. So I thought I'd just but, jump uh, in. Apologies for that. There's always some technical hiccup. No yeah, I think I'm not the only one who's not able to to see your your screen. If you could have a, a go at sharing it again, that'd be great. There, I think that we're, I think we're in business. Okay, good. Just make some other changes here. Okay. It's still dark, but hopefully it just means it's loading. Uh, okay, it says that I am sharing. Can, can you not see the slide or you, have you just got it's black? It's just a black screen at the moment. Can anybody see the slide? It's a black screen for me too. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll stop sharing and try it again. Thank you. Thank you.
Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you when I when I can can you see can you see my desktop, my computer desktop? It's still it's, showing as black. Okay. I tell you what, I, I've got this on my laptop here in front of me as well. So mm -hmm. I will try. Do you want to try uh, showing I'll, that screen? I'm gonna sign off from um from this system and I'll just I'll work with the other one, okay? Okay. We were we were having some uh, video difficulties, so Kelly was trying to uh, hack the hack the system to be able to show video and the screen, but it's uh, it's proving a bit challenging. So we'll go with the the option of uh, slides over video. Okay, we can only, we can only uh, have one. Let Let's see if I can get it here just on the other uh, laptop computer. Okay, just Perfect. one sec. Not sure what the weather is like everywhere, but we finally got fall here in the uh, Vancouver area. It's rain and and chilly, so it's actually kind of a relief after the uh, extended yeah, October. October. And no smoke anymore. Thank no goodness. smoke. That is that is a pleasant change. I've just got the, the sun coming over the Remarkables here in Queenstown and it's a clear blue sky and we're just going into spring. The days are really warming up and it's awesome. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I actually used an orange and a flashlight this morning to try and explain to my five-year-old well, why it was so dark out uh, <laughs> to try and show her the earth tilting away from the sun and uh, Great. Sketch, sketch North America and South America on, on an orange with a... <laughs> it's awesome. But, uh, yeah, so it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Hi, this is Steve Peck. Um, I'm calling in from uh, Gatineau, just outside of Ottawa. Beautiful day. It's about 21, nice blue sky. And I expect to be interrupted during this uh, conference uh, by the delivery of 15 cords of firewood to start us mm. going through the winter. Uh, this yeah. is Eastern Canada, and winter is coming. So we're taking advantage of the nice weather, and uh, instead of being a grasshopper and playing the violin. But, Stack uh, your wood. After that, we have to clean out the septic tanks, put in the uh, temporary shelters, put the snowblower on the tractor, and uh, get the cars ready for winter. And other yeah. than that, we're, we're fine. Yeah, no, that's all the all the preparations. I think I'll be happening a little later this year than well, might have otherwise. For the benefit of, of you out in, in New Zealand, uh, there are four seasons out here. There's winter. Uh, there's 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 the fall, winter's coming. Winter. Still winter and road construction. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, we, we can see your screen here. now, but we're um, we're not seeing your your slide. Yeah, this is the. Uh, <laughs> it it only opens the email, so it's. Ah, you know, it, this, is, this is a true hybrid presentation. Yeah, so. we're. You you are you are truly hacking the all the tools. Yeah, yeah. But I think we're I think we're a success now. So. Okay. There we so go. We'll, Carry on. Yeah. Sorry for the uh, the technical difficulties here. Um, yeah, I'm just going to uh, go forward and uh, speak to you about the background to the EMSA project. So everyone can see slide three there? Yes, we can see your screen there, okay. Kelly. Great, thank you. All right. So uh, yeah, once again, the story of the EMSA project goes back to late 2014 and, and before the EMSA project, or before the um, Oceans Protection Plan began. So Transport Canada and other federal partners have begun a series of workshops along the coast to explain how the marine safety system works and to get feedback from Indigenous and other coastal communities on how we can do things better and more collaboratively. One key observation was the importance of uh, Indigenous involvement in the marine safety system to be part of the planning and decision making associated with marine occurrences and other emergencies. So this is pretty obvious when you consider that each of the incidents that are pictured here um, had a direct impact on the adjacent First Nations community where they occurred and in most cases First Nations were the first on scene. Another key observation was the fact that communities lacked maritime situational awareness of what's happening in their own traditional territories, including marine shipping and the various cargoes that pass through sensitive coastal waters. 
So the requirement was funded under the Oceans Protection Plan to create a prototype system in partnership with Indigenous communities from across Canada's three coasts. When the Oceans Protection Plan began in 2017, we, we also had two similar projects, one funded by Transport Canada, which was EMSA, and the other funded by the Canadian Coast Guard, which was called the Collaborative Situational Awareness Portal, or CSAP. We progressed public engagement on both of these projects for the first three years, after which the Coast Guard uh, chose instead to work on, alongside Transport Canada and our Indigenous partners to adopt and further develop EMSA to support aspects of their work with Indigenous and coastal communities. So EMSA has evolved and expanded from the original 10 pilot project communities now to 13, including, including those that came on board uh, the EMSA project as an accommodation measure for the Trans Mountain Expansion, uh, or TMX. We launched the initial uh, version of EMSA in May of 2019, and we currently have about 760 users of the system from Indigenous and coastal communities, the federal and provincial governments, marine safety authorities, port authorities, academia, and the marine industry. So this diverse range of EMSA users provides a tremendous opportunity for broader collaboration, and it's already supported initiatives such as the Proactive Vessel Management Initiative, uh, the Places of Refuge Project, and, and so on. Um, so that there's, there's and, and also uh, greater support to uh, Canadian Coast Guard related operations. Okay, and now my slides on slide. There we go. Okay, you, you can still see that, right? You're good. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so this is a high level graphic to explain what EMSA is and does. From the left, you've got a wide range of data and information reporting sources from government, uh, government open source data to commercial shipping reporting via AIS to government vessels at sea, and from other partners in industry, academia, and of course, indigenous communities to the extent that they wish to uh, participate and share information. And then in the next column there, that data is consolidated into a common operating picture, which can be parsed and prioritized so the users have the picture that they need while avoiding clutter. So this includes data fused AIS maritime, uh, maritime uh, data information of all vessels uh, that are transmitting on AIS from, uh, from both the Canadian Coast Guard's terrestrial AIS network and the exact Earth satellite network. Our data fusion then is undertaken by National Defense in the, the Maritime Security Operations Center uh, located in Halifax. And uh, that ensures that we have the most comprehensive picture of marine shipping, albeit a couple minutes late due to the, the data fusion process undertaken in the MSOC. Then the picture is disseminated, and that's the third column, uh, using pass password protected accounts on the internet for display of a wide, uh, or rather display on a wide variety of IT systems including smartphones via the EMSA app. And yes, there is an app for that. Um, finally, our partners here in the, uh, the right-hand column, our partners and other colleagues on the system have a common operating picture that they can use either locally for marine safety planning and decision-making or in collaboration with other government departments. So now we're gonna take a look at a few key factors that have contributed to EMSA's success. First of all, the core of the EMSA project is a partnership between Canada and Indigenous peoples. It's built on respectful, mutually supportive relationships and trust. This is the foundation for everything that we do with our 13 pilot project host communities from all three of Canada's coasts. This is by far the most important aspect of the project. Without trust and mutual respect, quite simply, there would be no EMSA project. We've just returned from a week in Montreal working with our partners. And um, this is the first time we've been together since uh, the start of the pandemic. And it, you know, it was, it was palpable. It was really positive energy in the room. 
as we were getting reacquainted uh, with each other in person, in 3D, uh, a number of people who, who we'd never met in, uh, in person because they, they joined after the, the pandemic was underway. And um, it, was, uh, it was really quite a, a wonderful experience being together in the same space and to, together again. And it, it speaks also to our ability to build a project like this and, and do so right through the pandemic. And if anything, going online in, in systems like Microsoft Teams and, and Zoom, for example, it's accelerated our project and, uh, and provided the means for us to, uh, to make some really amazing advances all built on the relationship. So going back to 2018, we began our journey by first visiting each of our partner communities, meeting people, learning about their local culture, challenges, values and priorities, and existing projects. We, we dined together, we shared their homes. They literally, a family would move out of one home and into another, and, and they would make room for us to, to stay if we were visiting small communities like Hartley Bay pictured, uh, pictured here. So we learned so much by, by through these site visits and it really helped us to understand and appreciate each other as, as friends and, and colleagues. Another vital aspect of the partnership is how shared decisions are reached, including selection of our 13 pilot host communities. And even the selection process itself was approved by those involved. And when we were ready to move forward with contractor selection, that final selection was taken alongside our partners at a workshop in Ottawa. The Transport Canada team did learn a few lessons along the way. We, we made our, our share of mistakes and, and uh, mostly associated with not bringing our partners on board as early as possible um, in the procurement, the procurement process, for example. Um, so that was a lesson learned for us and, uh, and we've applied that lesson this next time around. Um, we, we, the Transport Canada staff, also continue to, to provide support to the project and uh, in particular co-facilitation of our, our two working groups. So while we've accomplished so much working together as partners, there were also times of uh, incredible pain and grief. Uh, there's no question that the, the pandemic has impacted all of us, especially so for our partners in remote communities. Um, and, and so we continue to work through this and adapt our plans as we go. Um, we also crossed a very painful threshold together with the confirmation of unmarked graves by several Indigenous communities uh, over the past year. Those announcements for our partners connected with deep intergenerational trauma and grief, and, and all of that needed time and space to be processed. Uh, we were fortunate to have the, uh, the leadership and the healing words of Chief Gordon Planis, and that's him in the upper right-hand corner there at our workshop in Ottawa in uh, February uh, 2019. But Chief Planis is uh, from the Sauk First Nation, and he joined that, uh, that first workshop after the first announcement uh, of uh, confirmation of unmarked graves. And he, he helped to guide, he shared words, and he helped to guide all of us uh, through a, a period, uh, a meeting of incredible uh, intensity, uh, a, a lot of tears, uh, raw expression of grief. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we set everything else aside. There was clearly we were, nobody was in the right headspace to uh, work on the project. And we focused on us. We focused on our relationship. And, and help to process that grief, uh, all of us together. Uh, a, an incredibly uh, powerful time for us all. Sorry about that. So moving on to the next key, uh, key point here. While much of this data uh, in the EMSA system is open source for all users, the system is designed to ensure that Indigenous traditional knowledge and data remains private to the communities. This is a fundamental principle of OCAP, which stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession. Users of EMSA can choose to share their data and uh, with others for collaborative work 
um, or possibly for response operations as with the Canadian Coast Guard. But this decision is entirely up to the Indigenous community, including how much information is shared and under what circumstances. EMS is also being developed as an agile project and incrementally over time based on emerging ideas and required functionality. We began with a prototype system provided by our selected contractors, Fujitsu Canada, uh, and then through partners experience using, uh, using EMSA on local requirements, it's constantly evolving, rolling out update, updated versions of the software every few months. And while we've been primarily focused on work at the local community level, there've also been occasions where EMSA has been used for other collaborative work, such as support to the, the PBM uh, Proactive Vessel Management Project, uh, or as a common operating picture for uh, places of refuge planning and decision making. As a platform for collaboration, a common operating picture makes it possible to undertake multi-jurisdictional planning and decision making, including governance and co-management discussions, projects, and potentially marine safety related activities and operations. The Canadian Coast Guard, as I mentioned, it also has also adopted EMSA uh, to support much of this work. And they'll also be developing uh, another system called CPIR, which I'm not going to go into. That's uh, a separate topic, um, which EMSA is, is going to uh, have a very close supportive relationship in, uh, in developing that system. So between Coast Guard and Transport Canada, you've got the whole marine space, um, marine domain awareness created uh, where the Coast Guard is focusing on current operations and the management of an incident and EMSA and Transport Canada supports the broader maritime situation awareness with the depth and breadth of data that you'd expect to support planning and decision-making. So I mentioned uh, that EMSA is an agile project and so, emergence, so uh, emerging requirements can be responded to quickly through system updates. This is another key feature of EMSA that's helped to ensure that the system remains relevant to the needs of our partners and colleagues. Our team use a Trello board to identify and track new requirements. And then as a working group, we discuss the various considerations of the proposed change. Fujitsu, our contractor, then provides an estimate of the resources in person days that it would take to make the change. And finally, it's prioritized with our partners. Also as partners, Transport Canada and the Canadian Coast Guard bring ideas to the table for prioritization, including operational tools and capabilities or requirements to expand the potential for collaboration with others. By doing it that way, we, we're, we remain ready to support a broader range of emerging requirements as EMSIC itself continues to evolve. Sounds like a lot of work and it has been, but we've also enjoyed uh, our time working on the project and uh, uh, we, we have some, some real characters and with great, uh, terrific sense of humor uh, working on the project from, from all, all parts of the team. Uh, so we've had a lot of, a lot of uh, great um, fun times along the way also. So that's how AMSA is being constantly updated, but we've also have um, leadership level working group. We have a, a leadership uh, level working group that spent many months last year developing future recommendations for the system, including scope, governance, operational requirements, security aspects, and so on. These recommendations were then incorporated into Transport Canada's return to government for renewal of the Oceans Protection Plan uh, and provided the basis for EMSA renewal under the Oceans Protection Plan as part of the last federal budget this uh, just this past April. The second group, uh, the leadership group, is we, we now refer to as our governance working group. Um, and essentially that provides project leadership, project management oversight uh, for the project moving forward. We've made the switch from a pilot project to a steady state system with its own collaborative governance mechanism. So the last aspect is uh, about, about EMSA. One of the key aspects is its application to support collaboration with a, with a diverse range of people and organizations. 
This may include everything from support to discussions about governance of projects and activities in the multi-jurisdictional marine space, to creation of a common operating picture in support of marine safety activities and operations. There have been some excellent examples uh, of uh, how this work has been done over the past couple of years on the different projects that we've been discussing. So also working with the Canadian Coast Guard uh, to determine how EMSA can best support marine response uh, operations. Um, we're, we're also looking at the, uh, the potential application of, of EMSA functionality to support notification of marine occurrences for Indigenous and coastal communities. Um, and, and maybe uh, I, I, we'll see if we have time to talk more about that during the demo. Um, EMSA has functionality that can be adapted to automate aspects of the notification process while ensuring that the right people are able to maintain control of the information flow according to their responsibilities in the process. So now let's look at AIS specifically. So as I mentioned earlier, marine shipping data in EMSA is a fused presentation of Canadian Coast Guard terrestrial AIS data and exact earth satellite AIS data. The aim here is to provide the most comprehensive picture of marine traffic information to indigenous and coastal communities to support uh, marine safety for local mariners and other marine shipping, environmental monitoring and protection, and, and secondly, to provide that common operating picture for use in collaborative management of marine incidents uh, and occurrences such as search and rescue, spill response, places of refuge, and so on. And as I, I mentioned earlier, the Coast Guard has adopted EMSA for use with Indigenous and coastal communities to make the marine safety system more inclusive of those communities that are most directly impacted by marine shipping and whose mariners are quite likely to be the first on scene when an incident occurs. So this is a, uh, I, I've captured this information from uh, one of the IMO's websites regarding um, their position on AIS data dissemination. The IMO has made it clear that they want to discourage AIS being shared, uh, shared, free, shared freely on the internet, primarily to protect safety and security of marine shipping. So this statement here, um, posted on their website uh, gives you the, the specifics of what they're saying. And I'll just pause there for a couple seconds while you, while you have a read of that. So EMSA honors these principles that are that are stated by the IMO by using EMSA to contribute to the effective management of marine and environmental safety and uh, safety and security by using uh, by ensuring rather that that password protected user accounts are provided to responsible individuals and organizations who respect our guidelines for use and finally, by ensuring that live AIS data is not shared in a public manner or to other GIS systems. Um, we, we have a fairly strict regimen on access to and the dissemination of AIS, and it needs to essentially meet, meet the, the principles that the IMO is, uh, is striving to achieve here. We can discuss this further in, in uh, the uh, question period if you like. So to summarize, we're all very proud of what we've accomplished together as partners in, uh, in the EMSA project, especially during the, the challenging time of a global pandemic. The, the future is quite bright for the project. EMSA is no longer a pilot project, and we've made the transition to a steady state system that can support work at the local level or expand to support a variety of regional and national priorities in collaboration with others. Uh, EMSA will remain flexible and adaptable by design, so we can stay at the leading edge, including the application of artificial intelligence where appropriate. And most importantly, we'll continue to support and strengthen our relationships with Indigenous and coastal communities 
where so much uh, vital work is underway as we speak. And I will pause there uh, and see if there are any questions. Does anybody have anything they'd like to, to ask Kelly before we move into the demonstration part? I know I've got a few questions, but I might wait until, until after Olivia's gone, uh, her butt, and then sure. bring those up when we are, um, once we've had that time. Uh, any pressing questions for Kelly? No. Um, seeing one from uh, Moquin, uh, can you give some descriptions on parameters of situations included in IMSA? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand. Can um, the person? Mokun, do you want to ask me? directly? Yeah. Sure. And I mean, uh, about the situation of awareness and uh, specifically, situation include uh, current, ocean current, sea state, like a wave height. Yes. And this kind of situation for modern time operation. Um, yeah, absolutely. When when we um, when we set up when we set up our, our partners with an AMSA account, first of all, we we figure out what they are most interested in, and we can create uh, an index, if you like, of initial data that supports what they are interested in. So if they're seagoing mariners, we provide all of the information that a seagoing mariner would want to see in the index, including marine shipping, uh, forecasts for, for pilotage use, um, where, where tugs of opportunity may be located, uh, if there are any, um, uh, any areas that are protected for southern resident killer whales, for example, um, we, we make all that information readily available, plus the marine weather, currents, uh, nav warnings, all of, all of that key essential information. And it's right there in the left-hand column. All you have to do is, is um, click an icon and, and it layers the data in the order that you want to see it. Um, so if, if, it, if it becomes overwhelming, you can reduce it or you can make it subordinate to another data layer. Um, Olivia will, will come on in a few minutes and she'll show you what we mean and then you get a visual appreciation. Yeah, it might it might help just to, to have the demo and be able to to actually see what EMSA looks like. So Olivia, take it away. Okay. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Olivia Hall here, everyone. EMSA Pilot Project Coordinator with the Pacific Region EMSA team. Um, I have the EMSA system here loaded on, on my internet browser had my camera on, just switched it off as a slight lag on my um, TC tablet Zoom, so I apologize for that. I'll turn it back on for um, our question and answer period. Um, so EMSA, the Enhanced Maritime Situational Awareness is a web-based geographic information system that allows users to upload their geospatial data and visually display and share with other users in a controlled manner. Uh, the system provides Indigenous and coastal communities with near real-time information on vessel traffic. Uh, the icons displayed on the map here, all displaying vessel traffic in near real-time um, with the associated legend um, below the maritime network here. So the system provides information on maritime activity along with other geospatial information um, fully customizable here, um, other environmental data noted here. Um, through a user-friendly um, GIS platform. And the idea is that through this sharing of data, a common operating picture is formed, which can increase communication, uh, support collaborative co-governance, planning, analysis, and informed decision-making around the marine space. And some examples of how AIS within EMSA is being applied by Indigenous and coastal communities um, include EMSA being used to enhance maritime um, situational awareness of, of vessel activity, excuse me, in a local and traditional waters and supporting um, guardian watchman programs. Um, if we hover over a particular vessel of interest here, um, the coastal inspiration passenger vessel here off the coast of Vancouver. Um, this. 
um, can see here the vessel information um, pertaining to this particular vessel. And we can actually click for additional vessel details, um, noting the vessel detail information, um, in-depth uh, details on the vessel location and other associated information here. Um, we can see the hazardous material, the type of um, passenger cargo vessel, and um, this particular um, vessel, we're viewing its um, particular uh, location um, from seven minutes ago. So as Kelly had mentioned earlier, there is a slight lag in the system, um, generally two, between two and five minutes. Um, these vessels are down all seven minutes ago transmission time. Um, another really helpful tool within EMSA is that it's used to analyze and monitor historical AIS traffic uh, to enhance mar maritime situational awareness in traditional territories and um, support proactive vessel management plans. So the time machine functionality, and I'm just struggling to get to it while sharing my screen here, um, just noted at the bottom of our web app here. Um, this time machine functionality enables users of the system to view historical AIS data and historical vessel tracks of um, particular vessels of interest over specified periods of time. Um, so if we, the C-SPAN Cavalier, select this particular vessel, um, for example, we can view the past 24 hours of historical AIS data for this particular vessel. Zoom in here. And if we zoom out on the map here, um, we've just um, selected the past 24 hours worth of historical AIS vessel details for this particular C SPAN vessel. Um, and we can adjust our um, spatial filter here to view um, the past 24 hours worth of, of data of that vessel. Um, so just the viewing, viewing here. Um, so super helpful for enhanced awareness of um, vessel activity in a given area or um, for a particular vessel of interest. Um, MSA is also used as a supporting tool to monitor coal and um, ecologically sensitive areas through the use of geofences. And I've preloaded here the uh, Southern Resident Interim Sanctuary Zone 2022 web app in EMSA. Um, and I'll turn the maritime network layer off here. Um, you can see here these red polygon regions in the Gulf Islands of British Columbia, off um, Saturna and Pender Island. Turn the maritime network um, to view the vessel details here again. Um, so these polygon regions um, have been set up in EMSA to uh, monitor for AIS um, vessel traffic that cross through these regions. And EMSA will track these vessels that enter or exit these geofences, which allow users to um, run detailed reports. Um, and here we can see um, from the beginning of October of this year to today's date, um, the particular vessels um, that have crossed through the Southern Resident Interim Sanctuary Zone areas, um, the particular dates, their maximum speed, and how long they've spent in these regions. It's an example of um, how EMSA can be used to monitor um, ecologically sensitive areas um, and enhance that maritime situational awareness of vessel activity in these regions. Um, and uh, Kelly did speak to this earlier. There's, there's ongoing efforts to support uh, the Canadian Coast Guard with notifications uh, through a semi-automated uh, system in the event of vessel incidents. Um, so users can subscribe to um, notifications in EMSA and have the ability to receive either text or email. Um, and this is an ongoing work in progress, um, just to note that, that there is an evolving functionality of the system to be able to um, notify users um, in the event of um, incidences um, and notifications from the Canadian Coast Guard. Uh, Kelly, did you want to um, add any notes to that particular point? Uh, with with respect to which, Olivia? Oh, um, the uh, notifications 
um, ongoing efforts with the um, semi-automated system with the Coast Guard? Sure. Yeah, we um, we've we've begun um, discussions with the uh, Pacific Pacific Region Regional Operations Center for the for the Canadian Coast Guard to to um, see what we can do to support their uh, their activities for notification of marine incidents. So, for example, when a when the Regional Operations Center receives a call, depending on the nature of the incident, they'll direct it towards one of their response organizations. Um, but for for initiating the uh, the notification of others along the coast, um, there isn't really a, a streamlined way of doing that other than picking up the phone and and if you've got an up to date contact list, providing a, a verbal update to um, to people in the in the communities in the coastal these coastal communities. So EMSA may be able to automate that process, but at the same time. Uh, we're, we're, we're working with the Coast Guard to ensure that whatever it is that we do doesn't duplicate effort. And, and in fact, just the opposite. We want to streamline the process for them so that they can disseminate information more, more quickly, accurately, and on the other side, on the receiving side, that it, it, it uh, dovetail what, with how the communities are using EMSA. And even to the point of further sharing that, that notification with others in local teams. So that re requires a certain amount of, of effort and, uh, um, and, and work with the individual communities, but it also helps to ensure that uh, any, any um, uh, contact information that's provided, it puts the onus on the individuals in, along the coast to keep their contact information up to date so that the software when it's automated, can can streamline the process. Now, we, we can talk more about that during Q and A if you like. Thanks, Olivia. Yeah, thank you for that note there, Kelly. Um, I'm just noticing we are running out of time here. I just have a couple more examples of um, how AIS is being applied within EMSA to show you before we move on to um, Q and A. Um, so I've loaded here the Places of Refuge um, web app. Um, locating potential um, places of refuge site locations when vessels are in need of um, shelter or assistance. Um, the little red icons displayed here on the map. Um, and um, displayed here in the red and blue polygon regions are also the um, geo-reference geo documentation outlining the places of refuge uh, contingency plans for the Pacific region. Um, and here we have the Tugs of Opportunity Fleet, um, the AIS Tugs of Opportunity Fleet um, displayed here in blue. Um, these vessels here noted on the map um, are displaying vessels that may be able to assist um, in the event of a vessel incident. Um, so a customized AIS fleet um, to display these vessels. Um, you can view the data panel here view the associated details of these Tugs of Opportunity Fleet and zoom into the particular locations on the map. Cluster of them noted here. Olivia, does this integrate with say weather information in any way so that you could see, you know, if there's a storm coming in, is there a vessel in a place where it might be needing refuge or? Uh, is there any ability to kind of have a predictive element to it? Yes, of course. So EMS is a fully customizable system on this particular um, Places of Refuge web app. This is just one um, data set layer that we have loaded on the map. Um, below here, you will notice we do have customized um, various weather data. Um, so we can overlay this on the map um, at the same time as this particular data set. Right now we're viewing the um, radar for use when it rains. Um, we can also view the, the wind data, environmental data, um, as well as any other environmental data of interest. Um, we've got over 3,000 layers in the EMSA library um, of particular um, different data sets. Um, so you could definitely um, view the Tugs of Opportunity fleet as well as um, any environmental storm data of interest. Um, can zoom in here to view the associated legend of this wind data that's just loading. Not too windy today. 
yeah, I wasn't sure if it was, I guess that it, those are the colors. There's some different gradients out off the coast here. Not much wind. So we've got a couple of other questions popping up in the chat. Um, and I just wanted to run through a couple of those. And then maybe if there's anything more that you want to show us, Olivia, we can, we can pick that up as well. Uh, so we've got a question um, oh, to ask if there's any way to download, um, as an example, the uh, traffic separation scheme layer. So it, can you download or access separately uh, different layers? Um, maybe I can speak to that. Uh, traffic separation schemes, uh, yes, uh, because we have um, layers of, uh, of CHS charts that are available in EMSA. The, uh, the data that's available for traffic lanes from CHS right now as a nav chart, um, there's, there's information which is lacking. And this is, this is a, it's an IT issue more than it is a, a navigation issue. Um, the other thing to remember is that EMSA is not intended for use um, on the bridge of a ship other than for general situational awareness. It's not intended for navigation or, or to be used to support uh, any any decisions for for the safe navigation of vessel or or collision avoidance, for example, there's other fitted systems that are are intended for that purpose. Um, the the information in EMSA, especially where where it comes to AIS, the data itself may be a couple minutes late. So um, that's why we make it clear that EMSA is not to be used for navigation. Um, but all of that other other data is is available and available to. Um, to, to bring up and display for for planning before you before mariners head out on the water, for example, and and traffic lane information uh, would would be part of that. Thank you. Uh, so Kim Dunn has a question, and Kim's with uh, WWF Canada. Is this approach to geofencing and the associated analysis being shared with other government departments for monitoring and management of marine protected areas? Um, the, the way we do it is uh, the individual creates, like the individual user creates their own geofence, and we, we can help them do that. So uh, there, are, uh, there are branches of Transport Canada, for example, that have used EMSA to support enforcement of, uh, of the southern resident killer whale protection zones, for example. Uh, leading to administrative monetary penalties. So it is being applied in the operational setting. But it's not a question of us sharing the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the geofence. They create their own based on the, the uh, areas that, they, that are of particular interest. And, and it could be e equally applicable to marine protected areas. Just keep in mind, though, that this is covering the traffic that is transmitting on AIS. So smaller vessels, especially in, uh, you know, in the coastal waters here uh, between Vancouver Island and the mainland, there's a, a very large percentage of vessels that, that don't transmit on AIS. But every, every, all the larger vessels or commercial vessels or passenger vessels would certainly have it. And uh, Moritz just popped up with sort of a follow-on question to that. Uh, can uh, VMS be included for vessels that aren't using AIS? Uh, sorry. Uh, maybe you mean VHS or VHF? VHF? No, uh, the or... VMS, the vessel monitoring system that's uh, that has to be fitted on fishing vessels. Um, well, let, let me put it this way. Um, if, if vessels have a transmitting system like inReach or Spot, all of that kind of information can be ingested and displayed by EMSA. Um, we haven't specifically worked with the vessel monitoring system, um, but presumably it's technically possible. Um, I have a sort of a related follow on question. Uh, now that this is a um, no longer a pilot program, is there an intention to roll it out to more communities than the initial 10 to 13? And what kind of time frame are you looking at for that? Because I think it sounds like this is a, a fairly intensive program. Um, yeah process to get communities engaged and and using it effectively so in terms yeah. of training and and access it is and and uh, we we do rely heavily on our contractor to provide that um, that one-on-one -on -one training um, we currently have uh well we've got about 760 mc users of which about 360 
360, 370 are from indigenous communities. And that represents 90 different communities that are represented in the EMSA system so far. Um, our intention is to continue the expansion to other communities as, as they have uh, time, resources, people available to, uh, to take, it, take on the work because uh, there is a bit of a learning curve and a lot of these communities are, are very small and have only so many go-to people who can, who can take on this kind of work. So, you know, we, we respect that, but at the same time, uh, you know, we, we support them as, as much as we possibly can um, when, they, when they make the decision to come on board. Uh, so I'm noting that uh, Rachel Mueller has a question about the time tracking tool and wondering if it's used to flag vessels that have gaps in AIS transmissions or jumpy ship tracks. And I guess a, a slight following question for me is, can it go back further than 24 hours? Like what's the, how, how far can you rewind uh, when you're yeah. looking back into the past? I'm, I'm gonna let Olivia speak to that one. Sure, thank you, Kelly. Yes, I, I only showed um, the past 24 hours as an example so that it would load faster during the presentation, um, but it's fully customizable. I believe that you can go back to uh, May of 2019 when the system was first launched um, to view the historical AIS details of um, vessel track activity um, back to May of 2019. And um, you can adjust the time periods of the time machine um, for the past 24 hours, 48 hours, um, past month. Um, if that answers your question. I see you have your hand up there, Rachel. Yeah, if you want to jump in and explain, Rachel, go ahead. Great. Yeah. So, clarification. So, uh, I imagine it would be really difficult to go through and selectively choose which vessel and 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 use that sort of human selection to identify which vessels have gaps. So I guess my question is whether there's a tool that's running in the in the background of this that helps support communities to understand um, vessel traffic that may be missed because of this uh, challenge with AIS where there's uh, you know gaps in transmission, mm -hmm. sometimes rather large gaps and or just jumps from one location to another location across the world somewhere. Yeah. Maybe I can touch on that one uh, first, Olivia. Um, the, um, the, the, the monitoring of vessels does depend on, uh, you know, the, the responsible transmission of AIS information. That said, we have trialed the system where, whereby we worked with the, uh, the Port of Windsor and they created uh, an interface that makes it possible to transfer their radar picture for the, the area, their area of responsibility and draw that into EMSA. So you can correlate the, the radar picture with the AIS uh, information. So that gives you the ability to, to monitor vessels that are, are big enough to be detected by radar that may not be transmitting on AIS. Other partners have also used EMSA to um, monitor geographic choke points and using um, motion activated cameras to be able to detect and uh, classify and identify right down to the, the name and registration number vessels that are passing in, in uh, more restricted geographic areas. And then that information can be, well, it is geo-referenced because we know the location of all the cameras. Um, so it is it is possible to um, uh, to to build a, a picture of vessel traffic even if even if they're not transmitting on AIS. Um, we we haven't crossed that bridge with the Coast Guard yet, um, and and there may be some some security issues associated with it. But we're we're working our way in that direction. It's it's getting better all the time. The picture is becoming more and more comprehensive as time goes on. And I thought I saw another hand up there a second ago. Oh, I put mine down. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was a great explanation. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we're going to be wrapping up pretty quick here. I just wanted to ask one last question about uh, how communities are using this system. And so you said it's fully customizable. People can choose what they want to see as part of their, their view. Um, 
Can you comment on any of the differences or similarities you've seen in how communities are using EMSA? Are you seeing geographic differences or is it just all across the board as to how what, what different communities want to see? Yeah, it, um, it really depends on what their local priorities are. Um, most all use it for, for to create that local maritime picture the, to improve situational awareness. Uh, some use it for uh, environmental monitoring, like the monitoring of fisheries habitat in, in local areas. Um, some use it, and well, and, and for security of uh, of their you know their traditional fishing areas uh, for for uh, monitoring activities in those areas, especially any activities that may be harmful to the local environment. Um, yeah, it's it's mostly about safety and environmental protection. Um, but then again, some are getting into some really, really advanced work with uh, hydrophones and monitoring vessel noise and correlating that with the movements of uh, marine mammals. And, uh, you know, potentially to the point where that information might be shared by the local First Nation and share it with passing marine traffic by the BC Coast pilots um, to, to enhance their situational awareness as they're transiting an area uh, to, uh, to help reduce the risk of, uh, of, a, of a vessel strike on a, on a mammal. Fantastic, feeding, feeding information in and taking information yeah. out to the, the yeah. system. We're, we're um, just at the very leading edge of this, but it's, there's some really exciting stuff on the horizon. Yeah, looking forward to seeing where it goes next as a as a fully operating system. Uh, just to wrap up, a question from uh, Level Pratt with Friends of the San Juans: uh, What's needed to get access to this system now that you've you've shown it to us? Can uh, can people get in there and and get a profile themselves? We've tempted everyone's appetite now. Um, well, it it depends. I mean, obviously, this is a, a community of practice who are taking part in this workshop. Um, if uh, well, if, if um, we, we have a scope of users, which are uh, different levels of government, federal, provincial, municipal, uh, indigenous, um, marine safety authorities, BC Coast pilots, uh, port authorities, uh, ac academia and research organizations, and the marine industry, and, and different sort of subsets of the marine industry. So fishing, for example. Um, so that's our existing scope, if you like, for the project. And uh, I, I think it's it's a matter of reaching out to us. And then if if you're not already sort of in scope within one of those user groups, um, we, we would take it back to our, uh, our our governance organization, our govern governance working group, and uh, and discuss it there. But essentially, you know, it's it's about um, contributing, providing value added to the EMSA system so that you can benefit from it, but also other users of the system can benefit from your knowledge and experience as well. Great, right. thank you. Well, if people have follow-up questions, uh, Kelly and Olivia, if you'd be able to put your contact info in the chat and then maybe people can reach out to you directly. Um, I will wrap it up here. We're gonna take a very short break, just to stretch and grab some water. And then we're gonna come back to a great presentation from uh, Moritz to focus on uh, biofouling and hitchhiker pests. Great. So looking into more about AIS coming up very soon. So if you can return at 12 minutes past the hour, we'll take a five minute break and then we will get into the next topic. Thank you so much, Kelly and Olivia for that really interesting overview of the EMSA program.